Good morning. Lovely to hear so much chatter. I think everybody's excited about actually being out. Um, I've got high heels on for the first time in 18 months, so if I go into a cramp, can somebody from AV please come and do their thing? I, I fully expect that might happen. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today and um, I'm not going to highlight any special guests because as far as I'm concerned everyone is special. Um, I do want to pass on a sincere apology from our chair, Tony Pearce. He's actually down in Malacuta at the moment talking to communities down there about the fires um, from last year but he's really very sorry that he can't be here today. Likewise, Minister Lisa Neville, who you are no doubt aware hasn't been well, and she is sorry she can't join us. And uh, two of the CEOs who contacted me, Sue Cunningham has got runny nose and all the rest of it this morning and said I better not turn up. And uh, Natalie McDonald from CFA has got some other priorities at the moment. So I'd just like to say at the start, should any of the discussion today trigger a reaction and you'd like to speak with, speak with someone, that support is available here today. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today here at Birung Ma, the people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We're recording the program today, as you can see, because there's lots of people who can't be here and we want to share that on various websites um, in the coming, coming days. And uh, thanks to Vic Pohl for, for making that happen. We're also collecting some Vox Pops and some of you have already been interviewed and we're going to make a little clip of that. So comedian Lauren Bock is here. She's with the, up the back there. Yeah, come and talk to her later. Don't be frightened to say a few words. So I'm Susan McKenzie. I'm the CEO of the Emergency Services Foundation. Um, at this point, I need to use this thing, which I always forget to do. Um, so uh, we've got a whole lot of guests here and some other guests who aren't members of our Stakeholder Council. These are the um, logos of all the agencies who are members of our Stakeholder Council. Thanks for sharing the day with us today. Of course, it's around International Women's Day and that's a day to recognise um, how far we've come towards gender equality um, and how far we've still got to go, clearly. Progress can seem very glacial. I remember starting a group at CFA way back in 1997. I actually forgot I'd done that until my old EA reminded me recently to get the voices of women heard and their ability to contribute to um, problem solving um, acknowledged. At the time it was groundbreaking and there were lots of, you know, this is secret women's business type comments going on and I wonder if there'd be much difference today. This has been a particularly emotional time for women as we become familiar with the stories of Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins and reflect on the fact that one woman is killed every week in an incidence of family violence. I used to work at the Women's Hospital. I actually wrote the um, Strengthening Hospitals approach to family violence. So I was very, very close to that issue. As people at yesterday's march said, we have had enough. We must all challenge and call out all forms of disrespect and inequality. As more people do, not just women, it will drive change. And it feels like there's some momentum at the moment. I'm very pleased to have some men with us today. It's a conversation about respect, equality and, and change is for everyone. And there are some incredible advocates for equality in our sector and they're with us today. The IW theme this year is in fact, let's all choose to challenge. A challenged world is an aware world. We're all responsible for our thoughts and actions. We can choose to challenge. We must choose to challenge. And call out inequality. Gender bias. Discrimination. And stereotypes. We can choose to seek out. And celebrate women's achievements. We can create safe and equal workplaces. There's no place for complacency. 
We can all help create an inclusive world. From challenge comes change. So let's all choose to challenge. So let's start. Why is ESF running this program? Because, basically, because no one else was. And as a woman leader, I felt impelled to bring women together. And because I see an intrinsic link between our mental health and wellbeing and how we are treated in the workplace. Let me tell you a little bit about ESF. It was formed a long time ago after the um, Ash Wednesday fires. It's a small not-for-profit with very big ambitions and a very small team. We're not government funded. We must fundraise. So if you know anybody with a deep pocket, please introduce me because I desperately need to speak to them. We have a board of nine. Four of those people are women and obviously a woman CEO. We have a stakeholder council, which was the agencies you saw before, and that's the 14 head of agencies that come together. Victoria depends on the skill and dedication of 125,000 emergency service workers. 100,000 of those are women, uh, uh, volunteers, sorry. 32, I wish, 32% are women. Very few in senior leadership roles. And that needs to change because time and again, researchers have found that diversity of thought leads to better problem solving. When we collaborate with people who are different, different gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, race, in our workplace, we all do better work. In fact, research has for some time shown that the connection, there's a connection between female leadership, increased profit, performance and profitability. profitability. I'd like to think this is because women leaders more often put people first. And that is of interest to me as CEO of the ESF because leaders who put people first are more likely to support gender equity and more likely to support mentally healthy workplaces. And mentally healthy workplaces are what we need more of. We know that because the Beyond Blue research answering the call done in 2018 told us that our sector has got a problem. And if you don't know, that research involved talking to 20,000 people nationwide from 33 agencies. It was a massive piece of work. And while many people said that they have good mental health and high levels of resilience, many do not. In fact, one in three people in the emergency services reported poor mental health, whereas it's one in eight in the general population. And that's more prevalent amongst paid people than volunteers. Three things stood out from that report. The first one is a supportive work culture is like having an, a COVID inoculation. It helps people. Second, many people did not realise that they had a mental health problem. They, they had it, but they didn't know it. And third, self-stigma is very evident. And what I mean by that is, I'll care about you, but I won't recognise things in myself. We all think that workplace exposure to traumatic experience is a risk factor for mental health, and it is. But poor workplace practices and culture are equally debilitating. There will be a time later to discuss workplace practices which are barriers to women in the sector. What I'd like to just tell you a little bit about now is um, some of the things that ESF is doing. Some of our um, key programs of work are the Work Well Learning Network. And that basically brings together all the man, uh, mental health and wellbeing program managers from across the sector. A couple of them are here today. We're doing a piece of research on stigma and help seeking. We all know stigma is a problem, but um, what happens is that we don't know what is the first thing that, that people recognise in themselves and, and need to take steps. We want to find out more about that. We're running a series of mental health workshops. Um, 
12 mental health workshops around the state for volunteers starting in April called Mental Health Matters. Next week, we're incredibly excited to be, be launching our Leading for Better Mental Health program. And that's going to bring together um, representatives from each agency across the sector to be part of a new program developed by the Learning Network that we think is absolutely groundbreaking. We're all, we've already had people from interstate contacting us about it. It's so different because what we've done is we've looked at what everybody is doing in terms of um, leadership programs. We've found out where the gaps are and we've developed a program specifically for these people. And it is as the name suggests. It's leadership, but it's with the focus on leading for better mental health. We're about to start a piece of work called Well Beyond, which was about working with older workers and as they transition to retirement. People, whether they're volunteers or paid people who have had a career in emergency services have a tendency to fall in a big heap when they leave. And we want to help these people. Um, we've also got the Emergency Management Conference coming up in July. They're just a couple of the key programs that we're doing. But today we're bringing together people to celebrate, inspire, learn, reflect, share stories, think about how we can choose to challenge. I'm going to share quickly a very a short story about when I chose to challenge. I was at CFA a long time ago. I was the most senior woman in CFA for, for a number of years. And on my very first day, I walked into a room of 264 men and me. And that was very, very daunting. And the, what was even more daunting was that I didn't have any pips on my shoulder. And of course, everybody is judged by the pips on their shoulder. And people challenged me. And I thought about that and I went home to my mother and I said, Mum, I want a pink dress, please. And I want one with epaulettes on the shoulder and three gold buttons. So she made that for me and I wore to work. And I had great pleasure when people challenged me. I said, my turn to talk now. And I was really trying to make the point to them, obviously, you don't need the pips on the shoulder to have a perspective and um, uh, that can be valued. I so wish I'd taken a photo of that dress. Um, we hope this day is good for your mental health. We hope you go away with a full and happy tummy. We hope you go away with new um, colleagues, or peers in the sector, and we hope you go away inspired. Uh, Andrew is going to just sort of welcome us and, and, and launch the day. You're always a hard act to follow though, Susan. <laughs> Can I also begin by acknowledging traditional custodians and lands of which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And Susan, am I one of these old people you'll help into retirement? Thank you. <laughs> For a woman to take over, yes. more importantly. Yes. And I'm a bit like you. I don't get this stuff up here. And because to tell you the truth, um, I actually don't know what it means. So uh, anyway, a bit of smoke and mirrors. But... Um, when we talk about emergencies and we talk about uh, whenever there is an emergency, we go through a period of chaos um, until we get our systems and our structures and our processes up and running and we move more into control. And I must admit, in my head at the moment, uh, about what I'm going to say, I'm, all, I'm almost in that position in terms of the chaos that's going on in my head in terms of what we've and Susan touched on it, what happened yesterday uh, in relation to the rallies and the marches across the country where women have said enough is enough, and, and some of those specific cases that have been talked about over the last couple of weeks. But then you've got to put that in, into context in terms of us as a sector of respective organisations and what we can do. I, I was having a chat with Brett Curran um, a little while ago, and w we, we will not solve the community's um, ills in relation to these significant issues, but it's about that sphere of influence piece about what we can do, whether you're the most junior person in or the organisation or the most senior person in the organisation, no matter what your role is, and that choose to challenge piece. And that's exactly what we saw yesterday, as I said, with thousands of women and some men that chose to challenge. We know we've got challenges in our own organisations and across our sector, and Susan touched on some of the statistics. There is more that we need to do, well and truly. 
And we know that if we want to talk about inclusion and diversity, it's, it's not just about attracting more women into organisations. We know there's much broader forms of diversity that we need to attract. But again, there's no point attracting women or other people with different life experiences into our organisations if they're not safe places. And, and we know, and Victoria Police can speak to their examples uh, around that, and again with the Ambulance Victoria and the, and the work they're doing with Verioc at the, at the moment. So it is so important for all of us to, to think about and to continually check and to test what's going on in our own work units, and if we want to look at that from an organisational perspective. So they're definitely challenges. The conversation I had um, at the table then about what I want to get out of today, and, and I've had the, the opportunity to attend uh, the other events in Bairnsdale and in, in Wangaratta on Sunday, for me, is to listen. I don't know, I will never know what it's like to walk in the, in the shoes of a woman. That's, that's a fact. I will not know what it's like for women when they tell me, my own daughters, my adult daughters that tell me when they go out, that they're always conscious of their physical environment, where they are and what they should be doing or shouldn't be doing, which is just wrong. But I don't know that. So I, I have to listen. I have to listen to those stories and I have to try and understand those stories. And that's what I've, I've taken out of the workshops that I've been to up, and, up until now. And there are positives, though. There are some real positives. So what I've, what I've picked up um, from a number of International Women's Day's events, you know, one of those, Life Saving Victoria. It was a, it was a great event. It, it had this nice balance, and I won't use the word old, but there were some more experienced um, people in the room, like Lucinda Nolan and Janet Stevenson, who's a serving member of Victoria Police. And they talked about their experience joining Victoria Police, you know, many years ago, where they were given the handbag, where they were given a skirt that they could not run in or do anything in, and what, and what challenged them, uh, no part-time policing. So, so that was a great discussion and talked about where Victoria Police has got to now. But as part of that same program, um, and we were down at Life Saving Victoria at Port Melbourne, those that know that facility, you can sort of sit on that, that first floor and you can look out to the sea. Well, Life Saving Victoria organised a rescue, and it was a rescue conducted by all women, and fairly young women. And uh, so what we saw was uh, young women on jet skis and boats and, and a young woman who's in the room here, and I'm going to embarrass her and say Hannah, who's sitting up the back there, who briefed us and was calling the rescue on, the, on, a, on a portable radio so we could actually hear what was going on. So when you think about, for me, what Lucinda was talking about and then what we were actually seeing demonstrated in front of our eyes showed the significant distance that some of our organisations have come, and it was a credit to Life Saving Victoria. Dan at Bairnsdale, one of my main takeaways from that group was a CFA volunteer who was talking about who was so well supported within their own brigade by, by men and mostly men in that particular brigade, but wanted to have spend time with women. So there's a women's network and so she always felt that when she was doing her training with men that, that men were looking at her sort of testing, you know, in fact, whether she was, could do the training or not. So it gave her so much more confidence to do that training with, with other women to then go back into that particular setting. But she kept making the point that she was so well supported by, by men. When on, at Wangaratta on Sunday, um, I did a bit of a question and answer session with some incredible um, women and I said, what's the one thing that I need to take away? You know, what do you want to tell me as part of your story? And, and for one, it was never say no. You know, a, as a bloke, if someone comes to you with a proposal, don't say no. Your gut instinct might, might be to say no, but just, I'll, I'll take that away. I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. Because this is a woman who, and her key message was never be afraid to ask. She actually asked for something and she was successful. And it was a great story. And I might leave Dom, Jim, who's going to speak about what happened up at Wangaratta. So that, that, was, really, that was really, really powerful. And, and another woman said it was very much this piece about listening. But don't just listen. Um, be genuine and then demonstrate. Do something to show that you're actually listening. And we are listening. Uh, we, we have a leaders inclusion and diversity group, which, you know, Tony and, and Brett, and there are women on it. It's senior people across our, our sector as a, as a whole. Where we're getting together, we've got another meeting coming up next week where we'll actually focus on what our work plan for the next 12 months is. We've actually got Nikki Vincent, who's on a panel this afternoon, coming to speak to us. So, you know, we are determined to listen and, and, and make a difference. Susan. I, it's all right, I'm finishing up now. I, I, so, uh, 
so again, what I took away though from those the, the sessions I've been to is incredible people, professional people that are doing such a fantastic job, whether they're paid for it or, or they're, they're volunteers. Another quick example is, is around aviation. So it's been um, Women of Aviation Week, and that started on, on March the 8th as well, reflecting the first woman to get a pilot's licence back in 1910. So across our sector, seen as a male-dominated um, particular part of the sector, but we've been, we've been highlighting women that are, that are pilots, that are MICA paramedics, that are air attack supervisors, that are air base managers, all the roles. I've actually, at the State Control Centre, I've often gone in there over this fire season, the three deaths, there's women in each of those deaths at the State Air Desk. So there, there are some real positives, but there is so much more that we need to do. So thank you for what you do day in and day out, not just in terms of your roles, but what you do in terms of, and, and the stats show it, in terms of supporting family, in terms of supporting community. I just want to thin finish with another thank you, and I was going to start with this, but I'll, I'll, I'll finish with it. Um, Susan and your team of one, um, it, it's relatively easy for me to turn up, turn up to events and, and, and say a few words, but Susan, the work that she has done um, with Bella and with very few resources to pull together these three days has been phenomenal. Those that know Susan know that she's not backward in coming forward. Those that have met Susan for the first time today probably already realise that. But she's the sort of person that we need to continue to drive the change that we need also in the work that you're doing. So thank you everyone, have a great day and I look forward to listening. Thank you. Gosh, he hasn't seen the half of it. He hasn't seen me in full flight. Okay, we're going to move on now and I'm going to introduce our speaker, Juliet Burke. So Juliet is currently adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales Business School. She's chair of the Institute of Company Directors 30% Club Education Working Group and board member of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London. She's not a shrinking violet either. Until 2020, she was a partner in Deloitte and the global thought leader for diversity and inclusion. She's spoken at TEDx, is, the author, uh, is an author, and in 2019 was named Australian Financial Review, um, one of Australia's top 100 women of influence. We're very um, happy to have Juliet with us today. She's a former colleague of mine. Um, I think we wrote a chapter in a book at one stage together, that's how we met. And today she's going to speak about resilience in a crisis with a gendered lens. She's come from the Blue Mountains to be with us today. So please welcome Juliet. Thanks, Susan. And yes, come from Sydney. That means that it's my first time out of New South Wales in 13 months. And I can't say how happy I am that the first place that I visited is Melbourne. As soon as I got back down here, I thought, what a wonderful city. So you are so lucky that you've been in Melbourne during COVID, but it is a pleasure for me to be here today. So thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for letting me talk about um, you know, resilience with a gendered lens. And the perspective that I want to take here is that resilience is obviously important to men and women, but to just weave in some messages there about the ways in which emergencies might affect women differently and therefore the coping strategies that women might adopt. And so you can think about yourself in terms of those contexts. So let me give a bit of structure to that conversation. First, I want to introduce some contextual themes, some broad contextual themes, and then I want to talk about the World Economic Forum's findings about what skills we might need for the future, and then look at two examples, Australian, two Australian bushfires, one which is based in Victoria and one which is based in New South Wales. They have some gender context around them, and then lastly, give you some questions so that you can self-assess where you sit in relation to resilience and some of the things that you might um, think about to develop your own resilience. Right, that'll be a whirlwind tour, the, you know, the whole perspective on gender and resilience in 30 minutes. Okay, right, okay, we can, we can do that. Okay, just the first one then in terms of context, and I think the context that we're in, you know, we've already alluded to, and we all know it, that part of the context is COVID-19, introducing a pandemic. And just let me just check if anyone's been through a pandemic before. 
just checking here, you know, because this was all new to us, right, a complete disruption. Although, interestingly enough, a number of people predicted that a pandemic was going to occur, it's just that none of us were listening. And so these disruptions have been part of the sort of um, research background. We knew things were coming, but we weren't paying attention to them. The pandemic was one. We might also have known, to some degree, that a march might happen in relation to gender equality because there have been rising expectations in our communities about equality. The Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. It's only a matter of time before that becomes a lightning point within Australia as well. If you don't deal with those issues, then of course they're going to create a, a context of unrest. That's part of our context. And part of our context as well is financial difficulties. Some of those arising from COVID-19, people losing their jobs. My job changed last year as well. Maybe some of yours did too. Context in terms of climate change, that's another one that's brewing. And context in terms of disruption, digital disruption, disruption potentially taking our jobs. Now, I'm just recently a, a member of the Rural Fire Service up in New South Wales. Susan said that I live in the Blue Mountains and we experienced bushfires two years ago, which were, like yours, horrific. And so that spurred me on to joining the Rural Fire Service. And I'm in the communications room, so, you know, doing the calls in and the calls out and monitoring where the vehicles are and things like that. And that is a job that is ripe for disruption. That cannot stay. Where I am taking in calls like that and writing stuff down on paper, creating a paper-based log for someone to look at later, that has to be subject to digital disruption. That is old school. And many jobs within this sector will be subject to disruption just as they will be throughout much broader society. So contextually speaking, there are lots of disruptions along our horizon, right? Do they make sense to you in terms of multiple forms of disruptions that I've said there? And are there some others that you might think of as well? All right, that's the scam. We've got environmental, we've got social, we've got digital, we've got... And let me just hark back on to that gender one just for a sec, because I want to weave in some thoughts here. In relation to, I said right at the beginning, social disruption, and we've already said that we've had the marches that are here. Let me just check in with you if, to see if you know where Australia stands in terms of 153 countries around gender equality. And I didn't know where we stood either. So let's just divide those countries up into top 10, top 20, top 30, top 40, top 50, top 60, right? And we'll just see if you can guess where Australia currently sits, right? Out of 153 countries in terms of gender equality. So would you say that we sit in the top 10 of countries? New Zealand, Norway, Canada. Top 10? Top 20? One person is top 10. Top 20? Two, three, four, five. Top 30? A few more. Top 40? Absolutely right. Top 40. We are 44th in the world out of 153 countries and we've gone backwards five points since 2018 and backwards, I think, about 16 points. I think, I think it was from 2014. We are trending in the wrong direction. And part of that is that we are not taking notice of this uprising in the community, but we are also not looking at these subtle things that happen to women's experience within the workforce and community in general. And that's the subtlety that I want to bring in today. 44th in the, in a, the world, seriously, Australia, get a grip. Right? Not good enough. OK, so what does the World Economic Forum tell us about the skills that we might need to cope with all of these complex changes? And this is looking at um, 2020 to 2025. These are the things, if we want to make sure that we as individuals, as we as communities, are set up for the future, we need to make sure that we are higher on um, critical analysis and problem solving, working with people, communication, of course digital technology, yeah, we have to be up on that, but these are very people-oriented skills. But what you can see there for the first time is this one up there called self-management. It is the first time that the World Economic Forum says, 
we as humans need to be better individually at looking after ourselves because this complexity, this, all of these contrasts mean that we are under pressure in multiple dimensions more than we have ever been before and we can't rely upon other people to look after us all the time. So a core capability for you and I into the future is we have to get better at looking after ourselves. We have to stop thinking that we can do everything and at a million miles an hour. That is not possible. So we are human beings who will wear out and we need to look after ourselves. Let me just check in if that resonates for you. Yeah. I think we learned that really in a really visceral way during COVID, right? That we are fragile in some ways, physically fragile, and we need to look after ourselves. And so now the World Economic Forums is putting something up there. So really that's the theme of, of what I want to talk about. What does it mean to, to look after ourselves a bit and what do we need to be looking out for? Okay, a couple more things from World Economic Forum. The top 10 skills that we need to be working on as individuals to make sure that we are set up for the future. And there's two that I've missed out here that I want to introduce for you. Once again, things that are sort of emerging as the top skills and for the first time. And you can see, once again, the skills that we need are complex problem solving, critical analysis. A lot of people thought when the World Economic Forum came out with its top 10 skills that they would all be about digital. You know, you just know how to use computers better, for example. And of course you do need to do that, but what you can see on the screen here is there's a lot of people-based skills. And the two that I wanted to highlight here are number two, which is active learning, like we have to get better at learning new skills, being open to them. So for example, in the role at RFS, I have to be better at learning those new digital skills that are going to come my way and be open to learning that. And then this last one, number nine, first time in this top 10 list, we have to learn the skills of resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility. And I'm not suggesting that you don't already know how to be resilient and stress tolerant and flexible, stress tolerant and flexible. Of course you do. But there are always ways that we can learn to be better at those things. And even if this is not a learning moment for you, maybe it's just a check the box and you can go, Juliet, I already know this stuff, that's great. But if this some of this comes as new to you, then there's a learning moment as well. And even if you might know it, you might want to take in some of these messages to share them with other people. So I want to focus really on number nine, resilience. I'm going to be interested to see how the World Economic Forum goes over the next few years and see if resilience kind of makes its way up the list. So in relation then to emergency services, and I want to focus here on two fire events that happened, one, as I say, up in the Blue Mountains, which was literally in my backyard, and one that was in Victoria. Because these two studies looked at those events with a gendered lens, and then we can understand, are there different things that men and women are experiencing and the ways that they're coping with these particular emergencies? So the first one there was Blue Mountains. Can I just check, has anyone been to the Blue Mountains? before? A few people? Okay. I don't know. What, is there somewhere in Victoria that is similar to the Blue Mountains, you would say? Grampians. Grampians. Okay, Grampians. Oh, that's interesting because we have a lot of our rock climbers from our area go to the Grampians too. That makes a lot of sense. A bit controversial, I know, rock climbing in the Grampians. But anyway, moving on from that controversiality. Um, so the Blue Mountains fires. This, the ones that I want to talk about here were actually studied um, a few years ago, 2013, that fire, not the one that we had in 2018. And, of course, many homes destroyed, uh, no lives lost, but a lot of property and, and broader than that. And what we experienced then led people to do research afterwards on how was that experience felt for men and women. But the first thing was the study asked what was the most distressing experience going through that fire. And you might think about yourself. What was the most distressing experience you had when you went through a last disaster? Just going to give you a sec to think about it. All right, so this was how this one. Most distressing experience was the fire and the evacuation. That makes sense. Did anyone else get that one? Yeah, can you put your hand up if you got that one? I just want to check the numbers here. Fire, evacuation. 
Only one or two? Okay, so actually in this study it was a third. So I'm going to be interested how you come up with the rest of them. What about damage to property when you went through something? Put up your hand if damage to property was something that was a, the, the most distressing experience to you. Can I just check, have you actually been through a distressing experience? Yeah, yeah, but you have? Oh, okay, so no, okay, I was expecting that people were lived experience, but just responders. All right, well, I'm not going to ask you to. Hmm. So this then was the response of people, people like me who live in the community, who were, you know, uh, people who lived there as well as people who were responders. So most distressing was the fire, uh, witnessing it and evacuation. Second was damage to property. You might have experienced that too. Third was um, reflecting on the fire later. Now that's interesting, especially as people who interface with people who have been through emergencies. Um, next was people losing their homes, looking at someone else and how do they feel about it. And then the last one, 10% of people said mismanagement by emergency services. That was actually something that they reflected was the most distressing experience for them. And I can understand that too. And then negative reporting. So I guess the question is then, with those if there was any difference in the gendered experience of people going through emergencies like that. So what would that have been? So if you are then responding to people in the community, what are they going through and what do they go through afterwards? Because for people like me in the Blue Mountains and people like you in Victoria, it's not just one emergency, but it's the next emergency on top of that. We haven't had just one fire in the Blue Mountains. We have had a series of devastating fire in the Blue Mountains. So this is the setting. So 45% of those people who responded in relation to the Blue Mountains fire said they had PTSD. This is nine months after the event, 45% of people had PTSD. And you were much more likely to be a woman suffering from PTSD as well as people who lost their, uh, their properties. Psychological distress, 23%. That was really influenced by community cohesion in particular. So I'm sure it's just the truth for you, but in the Blue Mountains, it's a very large area and we go from very small communities to quite large. The community I live in is 5,000 people. That would be a medium-sized community and much smaller and larger. And then the last one, which had a different lens on it from gender perspective, was 16% of people dealt with that fire event through drinking and mostly men. So already we can start to see a few differences here in the way that people cope with these kind of traumatic events, right? So I want to move on and then talk about Victoria because Victoria did a fantastic piece of work looking at the fire in 2009 and looked at it in terms of what was the result of that in terms of people's mental well-being two years after the event and four years after the event. And once again, is there any gender differences? So, in terms of um, coping strategies, just to sort of, these ones actually came out of the New South Wales one. What the New South Wales one said is that men and women cope slightly differently. And the coping for men and women around verbal articulation and an emotional response is that women are more likely to behave in a way that wants to talk about the emotions with which they've experienced that event. Let me just check if that resonates for you. I think as all women, you know, we, we like to talk about the emotions that we've gone through. Not saying that men don't like to talk about their emotions, but maybe it might take a few drinks before they talk about their emotions. Whereas at my table already, we've been talking about our emotions for the last 20 minutes. Is that true, Holly and Michaela? Right, we just got stuck in there. And that's exactly what happens when you're experiencing an emergency as well. There tends to be a difference in the way that men and women respond to it verbally. Seeking support, um, the idea being that men seek formal levels of support less than women seek that. It doesn't seem to be as much of a stigma to women to seek support than it is for men to seek it. Um, in relation to problem solving, there was a response that men are more likely, not saying that women aren't practical, but to get out and try and solve something with their hands, to do something about it, rather than to talk about it. And then lastly, in terms of resilience and recovery, that men found it potentially more difficult to cope with things, right? more difficult to bounce back from that. And the way that they wanted to bounce back was just 
getting on and doing something. And of course, that has that undercurrent then that the emotions are still distressing. The way that they manifest themselves is through drinking. So then in relation to the fire that happened in um, Victoria, what we saw with the coping strategies, you know, verbalisation and we saw some drinking, and I said to you that those coping the um, study that was done two years later and then four years after that, was that yes, rates of resilience improved in the community and that was great, they went up from 77% to 81%. But PTSD was still higher than you would expect. So it was 8.7%. It had previously been 12% and now it was 8%. Community levels of PTSD are 4.4%. So four years after the event, PTSD in those communities is twice as high as it is normally, which means there's a background setting. If you've got PTSD and you have another event, it triggers you. It is, it's sort of lying in wait, so to speak, right? The second thing is in terms of major depressive illnesses, it was sitting at 9%. Okay, that's down from 10%, but still people are having major depressive illnesses. And in relation to that alcohol consumption, it was still sort of sitting at, in that community, it was sitting at 22% and it had been 21% previously. So there's still this overuse of alcohol in those areas. And what's really disappointing is that there started to be late onset alcohol usage, which means that people had gone through the fire and they had not used alcohol as a coping mechanism straight away, but they had picked it up after the event. And unfortunately, it was young men who started to do that much longer afterwards. So you can see that there are gender differences in the way that men and women are coping with those events. Let me just check in with you there. Right, so we've just done big picture here that people experience fire-based events like those ones and you could maybe extrapolate from other emergency events slightly differently. And one of the reasons for that is because their experience of the event is slightly different. For example, men are more likely to stay behind and women are more likely to leave. And one of the impacts of that is that women ruminate over that I should have stayed. I wish I could have stayed. I worry about the people that I've left behind. That's a gender-based difference based on their experience, what they think about later. Women are more likely to be heads of single parent families, which means that when they start worrying about things, the sort of physical impost that it's had on them, they worry more about their families as well. So they're worried about their children in the long term. So there are gender differences in the experience and the coping mechanisms afterwards. So what does that mean? What it means, I think, first of all, and this is what the research studies keep saying, is that we need to prepare ourselves and think about resilience first up, and resilience potentially through a gendered lens, but we need to be on top of the resilience strategies because these things will make a difference to the way that people cope with those traumatic experiences. If we think as well about looking at people's um, experiences over time, there is a sort of monitoring thing, not just monitoring in the moment, but monitoring, as you can see from that research with Victoria, over an extended period of time, because people keep on going through trauma long after others have sort of left the stage. Safe spaces, particularly for women to talk about it, because women do like to verbalise the experience that they've gone through, particularly with professional networks, that's really helpful. And then lastly, to think about it in terms of, actually there could be gender-based differences, so to have gender-based different strategies. If men want to be more practical about that, enabling them to be practical and maybe having conversations with them at the same time, sort of like parallel conversations, rather than saying, hey, let's go and do therapy together. So that might be, you know, bringing those um, studies together says that there are things that you can do to anticipate what some of the gender-based impacts um, might be and then how you would cope with them. There was a piece of work that was done though, and this gets to resilient, the heart of resilience, that was about the Deepwater Horizon event. Do you remember that event that was, I think there was a movie about it, Deepwater Horizon was this toxic, 
oil spill that lasted for five years off the coast of Louisiana. It was terrible. And it affected you know, multiple communities along there. And what they found in particular was that the people who had developed resilience capabilities were more able to pass through that crisis and come out the other end without necessarily manifesting some of those um, psychological impacts that we've just talked about before. So you want to know what creates resilience. I mean, how, how is it that some of these people were resilient and how is it that some people weren't? And more importantly, how can you be resilient? How can I be resilient? So that's what I want to talk to you about now. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to do one where I'm going to get you to look at some questions up here so you can self-assess how resilient you are and you can think about then how to boost those resilient capabilities. So the first point is really getting a base on yourself. Because all of the research says, and this goes to you as an individual, but also you as a first responder, you can't help someone else unless you're, not re unless you're resilient yourself, right? So all of the nursing-based research as a place, a workplace that needs a lot of resilience because they face trauma on a daily basis, they can't be um, helpful to other people unless they're resilient. So same for you, first responders, you can't help other people unless you're resilient. So let's just get a baseline there. All right, so there are going to be 10 questions here. You may want to talk about this with someone later, definitely if it triggers anything for you, but this is actually just for yourself. Just to give yourself, if you were to assess how resilient am I right now, these are the questions that psychological studies ask of people. So the first five questions are this. The first one is, on a rating scale of one to five, where one is not at all and five is likely, what's, what uh, rating would you give yourself on, I'm able to adapt to change? So one to five, how adaptable do you think you are? One or five? Do you think I can deal with whatever comes my way? I try to see the humorous side of things when dealing with problems. So one to five, do you have a humorous bone? Do you have this attitude Having to cope with stress makes me stronger. That idea, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So one to five on that. That's called a positivist attitude. And lastly, do you think I tend to bounce back after you have illness, injury, or other hardships? So first of all, those five. See how you're going there? One to five. Top score would obviously be 25. Bottom score, five. Just look at the numbers that you've given yourself, first of all, and just add them up quickly. Where are you 1 to 25 on that? OK, and now we've got the next five questions. So you're at this point, you're probably thinking, God, I hope the next questions are easier because those were really hard and I've rated myself low. Or you're thinking, I'm going really well here, so I'm going to ace this, right? That's the binary. Is that right? That's OK. All right. I believe I can achieve my goals even if they're obstacles. Under pressure, I stay focused and I think clearly. I'm not easily discouraged by failure. I think of myself as a strong person when dealing with challenges and difficulties. And I'm able to ha handle unpleasant or painful feelings. Did I, did I call that eight? I'm not easily discouraged by failure. I'm, so, I'm not sorry if I missed that one. You should have five questions in front of you. One about achieving goals, one about staying focused, one about discouragement, thinking of yourself as strong, and the last one about able to handle things that are unpleasant. So just add those ones up for yourself, and where did you land on that? 1 to 25, and that will give you an overall score then, obviously, out of 50. Okay. I think what's important about those questions is, of course, you get an overall score. And resilience, we often talk about it in an overall way. You know, how resilient am I? And that's helpful. But what's potentially more helpful is it breaks it down for you. And so, therefore, you can see the areas that you might work on. And that's what I want to talk to you about, sort of five strategies that you might work on to improve your resilience score. And they relate back to some of these elements in here as well. Okay. So, for example, if we talked before about trying to see the funny side of things, and that was one of your low scores, I suspect that's one of my, one of my low scores, I'm a bit serious, then you know, now I know what I can work on. Mm -hmm. So, five strategies here, and this is the last slide, in terms of if you want to build your resilience. And as we said with the Deepwater Horizon event, 
If you build your resilience beforehand, then when you're faced with a trauma, your own trauma or vicarious trauma, someone else's trauma, you are more prepared for that. So the first one is this, to ensure that you have strong professional networks, not just personal networks, they're very important, but professional networks, so that you can talk to other people about the experience that you've been through in a professional way. Hey, I'm going through this, are you going through it too? I think in some ways that's what's happened with COVID, right? That we've all been able to talk to each other about I'm going through COVID at the same time as you, how are you coping with it? Okay, so the first thing you might think about is how strong are my professional networks? Do I have a group of people that I could talk to about the trauma that I'm going through, if I went through it? Second thing is this idea of positivity. And what I don't mean by positivity is Hi, I'm fine, all good, don't ask me any further questions. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about positivity. Some of those questions that were asked there before is this belief, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I will get through this. I've been through this before. That's what we mean by positivity. So if you can build that as a mentality for yourself, know that you've handled the situation. We all handled, we, we didn't know if we would cope with COVID-19, but we coped with COVID-19. Now we're coping with coming out of COVID-19. We will cope with all of those contextual changes that I talked about. Is that a belief for yourself? So building up that belief and thinking about experiences that you've had where you went through it and you came out the other side. That's a coating, that's a predictive factor. Number three is to stay connected with what you're going through emotionally, to be able to name it. Today I'm feeling like this. And we're lucky in a way because English has a lot of words in it and we can get very specific with the emotion that we're going through. But it is actually an important thing to specifically say what the emotion is, to really tap into it. So when you say, I'm feeling sad, Put a few more words around that. What, what, what is that sadness about, for example? Is it, is it this? Is it that? Go through a few more. Now, if you are a person who doesn't have a wide vocabulary, I'm not saying you are, but this, my trick for myself is to use synonyms. So if I'm, I'm writing a document to myself in a Word document, I will right click on synonyms and then it will give me a whole lot, 10 other words that might describe, if I want to describe sadness, it will give me a whole other word sitting beside it too. So that can be a way that you can process exactly what is it that I wanted to name that I'm going through. And then you can talk to each other, other people about that differently. Does anyone else use the synonyms, synonyms on the Word document? Yeah, yeah, okay, we're on to that one. Number four is balance. And I don't mean it in that really naff way. You know what? We all need work-life balance. What I mean is that we all need to have in our life more than one thing. All of the research shows that you, if you only have one thing in your life, you are monocentric, then you are less able to cope with trauma that comes your way. And if people are dual-centric, you have work in your life and family, or tricentric, work in your life and community and family, or work in your life and something spiritual and family. That means you have more than um, one egg in one basket. So if you have a down, down moment in one, in work, you have an up moment that you can deal with in family. So it is really important to have sort of the baskets kind of equally weighted. And some people think, well, God, if I had two baskets in my life, how would I ever do that? I'm so busy with work at the moment. I don't have enough time to put into community. Well, this research is saying that maybe you do need to make a bit more time for it because the more that you make time for that, the more that you will be able to cope with things when you have disruption. And then the last one is this idea of reflection. And it's the idea to write things down. When you're going through something, it's actually to write, to do some journaling, to do some, not just sort of reflection with thinking, but to write down that experience, which is why using the synonym button on the Word document is really helpful, because you're wanting to write down exactly what is it that I'm going through here. And journaling gives you that ability to reflect. It's important to do it, I know I said use the Word document on the computer, but it's actually important to do it with a pen 
because there's something in the brain research that says when you use a pen, it kind of slows down the process of your thinking and enables you to access different thoughts rather than just typing it or talking it to someone else. So those are actually the five strategies to build resilience. Think about your professional networks. Do you have deep and wide networks? Think about whether you have need to develop some of those sort of positivistic tendencies, maybe those sort of you know, mantra, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Are you in touch with your emotions? Can you describe them? Have you got a couple of buckets that you're investing in? And lastly, taking time to write things down. Thank you.